We'll uh, go ahead and get this party started. So hello, everybody. Uh, today we're taking a departure from uh, heads down development and uh, focusing more on the higher level admin stuff. And so to do that, I'm going to log into our, our test instance here. And uh, we'll just dive right into portal admin. So normally when you go in here for the first time, it's going to bring you right into settings. And uh, obviously I'm not going to go into all the details in here, um, but all this stuff is explained in the valence guides. So if you go into valence guides and um, uh, valence portal, portal administration, you can see all these different sections and if you have any questions about what the settings do they're all explained here um, and some of them actually have uh, tool tips you can hover over them and they'll give you some other information as well but some basic navigation things i'd want to point out is that uh, you can collapse sections in here to make it easier to find things and if you're on a more recent build there's also a, a search function here so if you wanted to search for, for example email related stuff you can just type that in and everything that has the word email in it, whether it be a, a name, a label name or a value, it'll uh, stop you in there and it makes it easier to find things. Um, I'm actually going to search for something called hidden. Let's spell it right. So in the portal administration section, there's a couple of things I'm going to turn on uh, custom settings and hidden settings. Uh, when I hit save, that's going to basically turn on uh, some other sections that are going to show up at the bottom. So if I scroll down now, there's this uh, hidden settings section. Um, now, you can also add your own settings to this, which can be handy because then you can reference them in your apps. So I want to show that real quick. I'm going to add a custom setting to this list by going into file editor. And the file that's behind this, the settings you see here is called VV settings. So if we bring that up, um, if you wanted to add your own custom setting, you just need to basically add a record to this uh, file, but it's uh, subject to some specific instructions. And if you go down, down towards the bottom of the section, uh, settings section, uh, let's see, adding your own custom settings, we're just basically gonna follow the instructions here. So I'm gonna say, let's, uh, I'm gonna use this later too. So it'll go, I'm gonna go find the root path setting and I'm gonna copy it make a few adjustments. I'm going to call it my image path. I'll make it 10.1. I'm going to change this group to settings and I'll leave everything else the same because I'm just basically creating another path. I'm going to get rid of these values. This value is actually the value that's stored and retrieved when you're accessing settings and valence. So now that I've done that, if I go back to portal admin, reload my settings. I'm going to notice down at the bottom now I've got this custom settings file. So I'm going to put something in here. So I'm going to show you how to use this later but that's just basically how you can create any number of your own settings that you can access within within your apps and programs back end or front end. Okay. Oops, I guess it would help if I put a proper setting. Let's see. I know it. It's going to be resources, Rob. Not just resources. I believe so, yeah. I think I, think I know what it's done. I need to take off that validation. Let me just remove that. It's applying a validation, which I actually don't want in this particular case, so I'm going to take that off. Back. I know the VB resources is a valid um, path because if we go to our uh, Apache administration, pull up the, uh, the config file, I can see that I have an alias for 
DB resources. So in this case, I'm doing a path from the front end. I don't want it to validate a full back end path. So uh, that's why it's uh, important to set it up that way. So it shouldn't let me do this now. Okay, so I got that saved. We're gonna come back to that. So if I look at the other portal admin entities here, we got users, apps, and groups, and that's my, my next topic for discussion. And I'm going to preface that with a, a little slideshow, just kind of explain how all this works in Valence. So when, you, when, you're ref, when you're talking about group authority, we're basically setting up how users have authority to uh, launch specific apps. So what you see on the launch pad here is based on your group authority and other settings. So let's just imagine that we have a company with uh, four users, Fred, Susie, Jane, and a guy who calls himself Superman, very humble guy. And each of these users can belong to one or more groups. So we're gonna say that Fred, Fred's the IT guru, he belongs in IT, and all he does is IT functions. Uh, Susie uh, works in accounting, but she also, uh, she's Fred's boss, so she also has IT authority. And Jane works in customer service, and Superman has what we're calling all authority. So we have a group called all, and that, basically is what it implies. Um, then we go to our apps, all the apps that are laid out on that launch pad. And let's say we have four apps, order inquiry, general ledger, inventory lookup, and portal admin. I mean, obviously there's more, but we're just using these for sake of example. And each of these apps in turn can also belong to groups. So notice that all these apps belong to the all group, but they also can belong to, you know, say customer service, accounting, I'm not sure why I put all in there twice. But this is how you can determine who can launch what. So Fred belongs to IT. So the only app that we've got in the IT group is Portal Admin. So basically with this setup, the only thing that Fred could see on his launch pad would be the Portal Admin app. Susie belongs to accounting and IT. Therefore, she has access to these three apps on her launch pad. Jane in customer service, she has two apps on her launch pad. And then Superman, being part of the all group, gets everything. So that's how the group authorities work out of the box. So if we go back now to our <clears throat> portal admin, now we'll take a look first at the users. Um, I'll just look at myself for, uh, for a safe example. Um, you can see that uh, I belong to all of these different groups, including the all group. Now, if we go back to uh, settings for a moment, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, here we go. Default group for all new apps. So what this is saying is whenever we create an app in Valence, by default, it gets assigned to this group. So that, that basically means, I mean, you could change this, if you, change this if you wanted to another, another group, but, but out of the box when you install Valence, you have this all group, and you need to be careful who you assign to this group. So if I go back to the users, I'm assigned to this all group, but you probably wouldn't want to have, you'd want to have just a handful of you know, super users take them off of it and then they'll only have authority to those groups that are remaining. To add a group back, I can just hit add groups and click it here and it shows back up. Okay, so <clears throat> we got environments. I'll come back to environments in a moment. And we got allowed apps and disallowed apps. Now you may notice on your system that these two L entities are disabled. And that's how valence comes configured out of the box. So we're back to settings here. I can learn to spell. There we go. Allow exceptions to group authority. So if you don't have that checked, then when you go into your uh, users, you're not gonna have the ability to go into those sections. So if I go back here now, I can see that these two are disabled. And I think that's probably recommended for most places because it's a lot easier to manage 
who has access to apps and give reports to SOX compliance officers and whatnot about who can get to what just by simply using the app lists, uh, groups and apps and users. But if you have a one-off situation where you say, okay, I, Fred belongs to IT, but I wanna give him access to just this one app. I don't wanna give him access to the entire group. You could turn on that feature and then give him uh, access to that app. So if I go back and turn that back on again, So we could go to say Avona, and she's only authorized, we'll take, take away all apps. So she has very little access, but we can say, well, she's allowed to access, in addition to her group authority, she can access active sessions and app usage. So these become exceptions to her group authority. And conversely, you could also say, well, she can get access to everything that's in her group except for some specific apps. So I could say maybe she might normally have access to the errors app, but I'm gonna say she can't get into that one by virtue of sticking it here. So that's what these uh, groups and allowed apps and disallowed apps do. Uh, you also notice there's a nab authority for Nitro App Builder. If you wanna, you know, you can obviously disable or disallow people to get into the Nitro App Builder uh, program itself, because obviously there's a lot you can do in here. But you could also say maybe some users have limited ability to do things within they have access to nitro app builder but you want to limit their ability to say create data sources uh, or widgets or apps so you can kind of you can take away their ability to create edit grids that allow them to change data which could be a no-no so you know generally speaking this might be something you might only give your developers typically access to to nab in the first place but if you had some super users with access to nab maybe you want to take away some of their ability to do things within nab short of just maybe arranging widgets and, or configuring widgets and things like that. Okay. So that takes care of users, apps, and groups. Uh, when you go into apps, uh, if you want to create a new app, you just hit the plus button right here. Let's say we wanted to create, uh, we'll use my custom setting to, to demonstrate another uh, way to use the apps. Let's just say we want the valence So I'm not going to launch a valence app in this case. I'm actually going to go right to uh, a web page, basically. And here's where you can use your custom settings as an example. So I created something called my image path. And then I can go right to, let's just go take a look at uh, exactly what that uh, logo file is. So I'm gonna go to resources, images. So we got this valence underscore logo.png. So I'm just gonna point right to that. Valence underscore logo.png. So I just kinda, I'm using this shortcut from my settings to construct my path and then I'm gonna finish it off with the actual image itself. Uh, we'll give it a little, I don't know what, uh, what would be a, face uh, settings now here's where you can say whether, whether it should start in another portal tab you can assign its category uh, we can put it up in the administration section so it shows at the top you can say whether they can see it in the mobile when they log in with the mobile app or whether they see it in the desktop or both and how many maximum number of instances of that app can be launched uh, simultaneously uh, you notice by default, it's assigned to all groups. So I'm going to see it because I belong to the all group. But if someone in another group, say, uh, in the Avona test group, uh, wanted to see it, I'd need to make sure that that's turned on for them. And if you're doing multilingual, you can put translations for the app, but we don't need to worry about that right now. So now that I've saved that, if I go back to my launch pad, I'll see I got this Valence logo app up there, and I screwed it up. <laughs> Uh, always fun to do these things live when you think you got it set up right. Let's see what I got. Uh, resources, images. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure what I screwed up, but I won't waste time trying to figure it out, but you get the idea. 
Okay, so category, well groups, I'll just cover that real quick. So if you have new groups you want to create, if you want to create an accounting group, you can just simply put it here. You can, you can assign it to apps right from here if you wanted to. So now we're just we're creating a group called accounting. They've got two apps they can get to. You can throw some users in there too. It could say, okay, this is a sec offer and a bono. So we can save that there and then you can go uh, log in as one of those two and they would, they would be able to see that. Okay. So that covers users, apps, and groups. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the launch pad here. So the categories that you see on the launch pad are basically going to be configured by this uh, by the categories here. So if I go in the categories, you'll notice we've got administration, utilities, documentation, examples, blah, blah, blah. Down at the bottom of the screen you had, if I scroll down, we see this Avona test and non-categorized. So let's say we wanted to turn off this section so people don't see it. So I could, I could delete it which would take, take these apps that are in there and throw them in the non-categorized. The non-categorized non category is itself a, a mandatory category. There's no option to delete it. Anytime you create an app that you don't assign explicitly to a category, it's gonna throw it, throw it in here. But I could edit this and just say it's not enabled. And then no, you don't see it's disabled on the screen here. So when I save that, then you'll notice when you go back to the portal that that section is now, now missing. You can also rearrange your categories. So if I wanted to put the non-categories category up, up below administration, I can just drag it on the left here. So when I save that and come back in, we'll see that now it's up here. So. Get rid of some of these here. Okay. So let's talk about environments now. So environments are how you control your library lists that the users are gonna have access to when they launch apps. Um, the default library list that comes with the families is called base. And generally speaking, we recommend you don't use the base environment. You recommend creating your own. So if we wanted to create, say, a, uh, we just call CNX test. Um, you always want to make sure you have in your library list, preferably near the top, the, the base library of that instance. So in this case, it's Valence 5.2. Then we can add other library lists, like say CMX Live. You have as many libraries, it's up to 250 uh, in an environment. Then when you save it, that, that creates the environment, but then you need to give authority to that environment for the users that should be able to, to access it. So if I wanted myself, for example, to have access to this environment, I could go here and say, okay, I'm entitled to go into the CMX test environment. So now that I have two environments, when I log in, I'm gonna have, I'll have that option to change my, my environment. So you'll see well, once I've logged in, by default, it throws me in whatever the environment was that I was last logged in with, which you can see here. But now that I've been entitled to more than one environment, I have this option to change it. So I can say, okay, let's switch to the CNX test environment. So now I'm running with that library list in place. So uh, if you had database files and stuff in CNX Live, I would be able to access those now. Um, you can use the hierarchy to control whether the, you know, the test or production and stuff like that. So lots of different uh, ways to, to put that to work, but just wanted to make sure that everyone's aware that you can have as many environments as you want. And if we want to turn off an environment, I can disable it. So if I want to say no one's entitled to get into this base environment anymore, I can just save that. And then now, if that's the only environment they're assigned to, they won't be able to log in. So you got to be careful with that. Okay, languages. So when you log in or when you go to the login screen of Valence, you see those choices of languages. Um, that shows right here. You can control which of these languages they can select by disabling and enabling them. So back into Portal Admin, uh, I can I could disable some of these and they would no longer uh, apply on their login page. And we can also change the uh, uh, 
CSID for the for Fusion 5250. That's a, another separate topic on itself, but you can definitely uh, control uh, the character set code that's used in the various green screen emulator environments uh, that you see out there in the wild. That's the big deal for the double byte character set countries. Okay, next on the list is developer tokens. Actually, before I get much further, let me talk a let me talk a little bit. Go back a second to environments. So I mentioned you could have test and base, and the the setup actually would allow you to co-mingle your production and your test and your QA development and whatnot by creating separate environments. But a lot of times, I would, in most cases, in fact, I would recommend creating a separate a completely separate instance. So right now we're in CNX test X, CNX port 7052. Um, another way to have people do tests would be to have them log in a separate instance. And the, the reason that's, one of the many reasons I think that's important is if you look at your active jobs, um, if this is, this is the base instance you're running right now, but let's say you had a, a development instance um, say like BB Zoom 5.2. In fact, you know, here, here's some good examples. We got some jobs that are hung up in message wait. You, know, you only get so many CGI jobs that are gonna, they're going to spawn until you hit your, your ceiling of you know, 40 or whatever it's set to in your Apache settings. So um, it's a good idea in that, for that reason because people are doing testing is to have a separate instance so that these jobs hanging up aren't impacting your production users in any way. So that's where uh, I'm going to come out of Portal Admin for a moment and jump into Instance Manager. That's where Instance Manager comes into play because you can use this to manage your various instances. You might have a base instance, you have a development instance, you can have a production instance. So to explain all that, how all that works and how it also can be leveraged to help you with uh, updating your instances to be on the latest build, uh, I got a few slides to talk about that. So when you first went to cnxcorp.com and downloaded the Valence installer, it installed the ba a base instance called Valence 5.2, whatever happens to be the current uh, build, which is uh, might be you know, 5.26, I think we're up to uh, 6.08 now. So when you wanna create a new instance, once you've got this, you launch the instance manager tool and you can hit the plus button. So if we go back here, hit this button right here, you can ask it which instance you want to copy. Maybe you want to copy your base or your already created instance. It's going to prompt you for some various things. You, you know, the name of the instance, which usually what ha by has to match the library name, what path you want its files to be held in, what port you want to access it on, whether it's a development or a test instance, and some basic, basic uh, description. And then when you hit save, it'll go out there and create that instance. So that that's how you can basically get uh, a new instance running on the same build as the base or whatever you're copying from. And then you can also use that to create other instances copied from that instance. So this is an important setup and this is actually what we would call a best practice because what this means is when you download new updates, when as we release, we really release the new build about once a month. So when you download the installer, uh, and you've already got balance installed, when you run it, it's basically gonna update the instance to the latest build. So now you've got your base instance independent of your production and development instance running on the latest build. You can check a few things out in there and then when you're ready, you can use Instance Manager again to update the instance. There'll be a special button that you can click. It would be, it would be right around here. In this case, my, my base instance is running in the same version as the uh, development instance, so there is no button. But if there was, then I could click that and use that to basically update that and mirror the version, uh, the build and the development instance to match the base instance. And this is important because now I've got this instance updated and I can kick the tires. You know, we're releasing all sorts of new features. So I'd like to say that's almost always bug free, but you can't be 100% sure. So. It gives you a chance to kick the tires and make sure everything's working as you expect. And once you've confirmed it's good to go, you can do on a weekend or an evening or just you know during the day when the users are, are at lunch, you can say, okay, now I'm ready to update the production instance and get this version updated to, to match the base. So if you have 
not done that. If you've already installed Valence and you got all your users logging into the Vase instance, we've got a post for you. If you go to uh, cnxcorp.com, go to blog, scroll down a little bit, see best practices for managing your Valence instances. This post gives you step-by-step -step instructions for taking you from a situation where all you have is the base instance to having uh, you know, separate instances for de development and production, or at least having a separate production instance. And that, that sets you up basically to make, to make your uh, upgrade process a lot less painful and you can roll updates from base to production on your schedule whenever it's convenient. So check that out when you get a chance. Okay, so that's Instance Manager in a nutshell. Uh, let's go back to Portal Admin. So we left off at languages, so let's talk about developer tokens. Now, developer tokens are great when you're doing any kind of uh, backend development, RPG. Uh, you might be doing some web service uh, development, and this can be a great way to do a quick test of it. In order to test your, your work, you need to create at least one developer token. So when you go to create a token, it's going to ask you for the name of the token. Just call it testing. What user you want that call to run under? So I can run it under myself. Uh, which environment library list you want it to apply when it's being used, and then you can set an expiration date on it. And then when you save that, that basically makes it available for you to pull. In this case, I got a test. Maybe I should take call it a test base just to distinguish them. And I'll call this one test CMX. So now I've got two uh, separate uh, test tokens, developer tokens, and I can use these then when I go and use say the test RPG call app. So if you're, for example, on the back end, there's all sorts of example programs. If we wanted to like say, look at EX grid all. I can see that this uh, RPG program is looking for an action called load grid. So I can come over here and say, okay, let's call EX grid all. An action is load is just remember me from playing with it before. And we could pass, you know, other variables that the program might be looking for. And when we hit call, we can basically get an interactive check to see, is it responding the way I want? Here's, here's the raw response, here's the formatted JSON response. Uh, if you're using Sencha Architect, you can get models out of it. I'm not gonna go into that right now. Another separate developer diaries uh, topic for the future. But in any case, uh, this can be a great way to uh, test your RPG programs. You can also call PHP or other IFS files and get responses from them. And that's all based on developer tokens. Now you'll notice also there's an option to make IP address specific. So I could say whenever a call is made from 192.168.3.4, then that would that would be uh, basically implying that we're using this developer token. And that's what you would do for Architect. If you don't know what your IP address is on the current machine, you can just click that and we'll throw one in there for you. So. Uh, this is really mainly for you, for use with uh, architect and other external development uh, tools. So another topic for another day. Okay. Uh, web services. Well, this kind of segues nicely. So web services uh, would work in tandem with uh, the test RPG call uh, tool pretty well too. So we have a couple web services that are distributed out of the box. Um, but if you create your own web service, this is, this is where you maintain it. So if I wanted to add a web service, I could just put the URL, the description, and the program name that it should call. And then I can add the consumers of that web service here. So if I go back to the one we've already got set up. This is the one that kind of comes, uh, or that, that does come out of the box with Valence. So it's called Service Test. It's actually calling a backend program called EX Web Serve. So if we go back here and take a look at that, you can see, you know, it's got, uh, a send response procedure, and it's gonna just send just a basic response. 
So when you have your consumers uh, of the web service, if you click this little link icon here, you can see the URL that's set up based on your uh, portal admin settings uh, that is gonna be called uh, to trigger that web service uh, to get a response. So if I copy this, and go put it in a browser, you can see that it's actually responding. And I could have also done that with the test RPG call app, right? So, that will probably, web services could probably be a topic on its own as well. So, keep, that's on the list of uh, future uh, discussions, uh, future sessions, episodes. PHP integration, that's not really something we're equipped to go into right now, but if you're doing PHP development, you can uh, verify that it's set up correctly using that. There's a section in the guide on how that works. Uh, remote databases, so you use Portal Admin to also set up links to other systems to pull data for, say, Nitro App Builder or for your RPG programs uh, that are uh, rendering data in balance. Uh, fairly straightforward, so if I say let's add uh, let's say we want to do our CNX dev box. Uh, you pick the driver. So the drivers we support for pulling data from other platforms, it can be another IBM My Machine, it can be running MySQL, it can be running Oracle, or SQL Server, uh, based on whichever version of Java you've got installed on your IBM I. So you pick that. Uh, once you've hit that, you can just put the uh, address to get to it. Um, or if you got a alias like we do what user and, and um, password to access that and then once you have that there and then you can actually reference that in your uh, app builder so if we go to app builder and go to create a new data source it only works for wizards currently um, but you click the remote database and then you can see that that's available for you to select and you can go and pick your library and files and stuff and go to town from there. That's probably another topic in itself, so I won't get too deep in the weeds on that right now. Uh, let's see, I already had that open. Okay, we'll get rid of this. Uh, last but not least is logs. Now this can be very handy. Um, your system uh, is making all sorts of calls all day long to Valence, uh, and some of those calls that users are making might be, you know, might be taking too long, or maybe someone reported they had a problem, but they can't exactly remember what they were doing. So you can use the log function to go in and kind of uh, interrogate or inspect, the, do a forensic uh, examination of what was going on when. So if someone told you, well, you know, yesterday morning I was running a certain program, so you could say, okay, let's just search for yesterday. And if the user it would be me in this case, I can see all the different things that I was calling yesterday on that system. And then maybe I might narrow it down to, uh, you know, I was doing something in the environments. So then now I've lim limited myself down to you know eight or nine calls that uh, might be suspect. And then I could, I could zoom in on any one of these, like this get libraries call. And I can see here's the call that was made to the back end. Here's what was posted, the action of get libraries. And I can see the response of what came back on that call. So if someone told me that they were trying to get a list of libraries and they only got three, I mean, you know, this might point me to, to where it happened. Um, but the filters can also be used for other purposes. So if we did reset all these filters, I could say, show me things that are taking uh, an inordinately long time. So show me anything that's taking more than a, a thousand milliseconds or one second. And this is actually something that could be useful to, to do for just, you know, just checking to see where your performance might be suffering. Um, you can see that some of these are taking a long time. You know, anything longer than a few seconds is generally kind of slow. So if it's three seconds or longer, it's actually being highlighted in pink here. And you can actually uh, sort this column to say, okay, let's just see what, what were the longest uh, running calls on the back end. So here was a NAB import that took 152 or 1.5 million. Obviously something was going on with that. Um, Updating an instance here took uh, 717 seconds. So 
you know, these are obviously normal, but you might see some that were, so that were taking a little bit too long and it might be a prompt to say, okay, uh, this, this uh, IBM I dashboard is taking 5.8 seconds. I could probably maybe go create some indexes or something for that app and make it uh, run a little faster. So uh, by default, I'm not sure if it's, if the logging is turned on when you first install, it may not be, but you can stop and start it right here. So right now if the logging stopped, I won't get any new entries in here. But I can start it back up again, which is also controlled from um, settings. So if I go to logging, it's just log. Lots of log here. Let's see. There we go. Log settings. So these by base by clicking on that stop and start, I'm basically ch changing these settings here, and you can control all sorts of things, including logging SQL statements. So if you're doing uh, any kind of SQL and you want to see what the SQL statement is, you can log SQL statements and then go into uh, file editor, and those SQL statements are actually logged in a separate spot called vvgenlog. And when you're logging those statements, you can actually see them. Well, they're actually, we're not logging. We haven't been logging them here. Let me go find, I know we are in another instance. So if you are logging your SQL statements, you can see those being logged here and see how long they're taking. So it can be very handy as you're tooling around on the system to uh, keep track of uh, longer running. I think these are all running pretty lickety split, but um, if you wanted to see what the statement was that was running, that's a good way to get to that. Okay, so I think that's about it. I wanted to uh, point out one other thing. Um, if you go back to our CNX website, um, the forums, you know, we were talking about instance manager earlier where we can maintain you know, these, uh, these build versions. If you're not already, already aware of this, there's a release history that shows you what the builds are for each different version. Currently on 5.2 plus, uh, version six should be coming out later this summer. But you can see all the different versions that have been released, and each one of them has indications of, of what the, what the main things, the main changes were for that particular build. So if you're down here on you know the first five two plus build 2018 or 528, these are all the things that have changed or been enhanced or fixed since that. <laughs> Quite a few things, and if you're on the current build, you can see what's pending for the next build, which will probably be uh, sometime in July. Or late June. So now when you're when you're in the portal and you want to know well, what version am I on, um, there's two ways to tell. You can go to uh, <clears throat> instance manager would obviously tell you if you have authority to that. So we can see that we're on 0611 on this box. But as a user, you can also go here and just click on your uh, user and then go down to about and that will also tell you which version you're running. So uh, if you're ever sending us an email uh, or, or logging uh, a support issue on the forum, uh, it's always helpful to know this uh, value because that often uh, has a bearing on any kind of behaviors you might be trying to uh, describe. And along that note, I would also say if you're not already a member of the forum, I uh, highly recommend you join. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, if you have features you'd like to see added to future release, you can add those here. We've also got all sorts of uh, uh, user questions and things where you can find the answers to your questions or post questions of your own that the user might uh, user community might benefit from and you can search for it up here. So um, if you're not already a member of the forum, I uh, encourage you all to join. Okay. Uh, were there any qu questions that came through, Johnny? Um, uh, some we've already answered. It was just talking about, it really wasn't specific to administration. It was more um, like consuming a web service um, how would somebody do that? Uh, we just stated that, you know, you could create a, um, you can either through nav cause they were talking about nav specifically, 
do a uh, script within behaviors or a pre-execution RPG program that would consume the, the a web service, which is not really valence related at that point, but we said we oh, might an external web service. Yeah, yeah. We might do a DD session on it. And then somebody was asking about promotion of nab apps between valence instances, like automatically versus import export. And um, I think there's been some uh, back and forth on that. So I don't think it really relates to the content you were talking about. Um, but one thing I, I think we <clears throat> like to point out too, is when you were talking about categories um, and like how we can like hide them, right? You can hide some categories in portal ad. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I like to point out is that I know customers will use this um, specifically because let's say you have a, uh, an application that you're, a user would never launch directly because it's like a detail related. Let's say it's order details. So it's expecting to be called and uh, passed an order and then show the details of that order. So you could um, hide that category, right? Um, but then your app that's running in the portal could still call it. So they won't see it on the launch pad, but I could still call that cat. I could still call that app from within the portal. Um, so your app a could, um, all right, let's say you just put test is hidden. So app a calls test, but the user can't call test directly because test relies on possibly parameters being passed to it. So you wouldn't see test. The user wouldn't see test on the launch pad, but another app could call test from within the portal. Yeah, it's a very, very good use for that use case for that. So I think that's that's the only thing I thought of when we were going through when you were going through this. So I don't think I have anything. And there's no other items in the chat or questions. So if no one has any questions, then once, twice, I think we're good. All right. Well, everyone have a good weekend. Yeah. Thanks. Good for chat. With you. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks everybody.